Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. I'm Catherine Brewer, and I will be talking about establishing prairie drop seed in restored prairies. So when we talk, or so we'll go into um, an outline to start with. First, some background information on prairie drop seed, the species, and then some information on broader topics in plant conservation. And that's going to be really important because the two projects I'm discussing today that I work on are really rooted in plant conservation. So the first project is the status of prairie drop seed in Minnesota, and the second is increasing rates of establishment of prairie drop seed in restored prairies. And of course, we'll go through experimental design, planting, and harvest. But first, I'd like to acknowledge and thank my funding sources, my advisor, Mary Meyer, who is partially funding me on her experimental research station funds, and the Department of Horticultural Science, who are also partially funding me as a Center for Winter Hardy Landscape Plants Fellow. Thank you both. So moving right into background. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with with all types of grasses, um, perhaps most commonly what we think of in Minnesota are our agronomic grasses. Of course, grasses have huge um, ecological importance and are used quite commonly um, as ornamental landscape plants. So we're gonna be talking about prairie drop seed, which is a grass. So I just wanna clarify a few terms before we start. Um, so when we talk about grasses, there are these two major divides, um, rhizomatous versus bunch grass or warm season versus cool season. So rhizomatous grasses are those that spread through rhizomes, so vegetatively through the ground, versus bunch grasses, which do not have rhizomes um, and have more of a dense crown. And then warm season versus cool season has to do with um, respiration, C4 um, versus C3 respiration. Um, however, an easy way to think about it is when the plant puts on the most growth. So warm season grasses put on the most growth during the summer months and cool season grasses put on the most growth during spring and fall. So prairie drop seed or Sporobolus heterolepis is a member of the Poaceae family. Uh, it's a North American native prairie grass and a warm season bunch grass. It is wind pollinated and a diploid and it prefers upland sites with well-drained soils. However, today you'll most commonly see it in landscape plantings, um, even though it is one of our native prairie grasses. So this planting that you can see on the right is in front of Cargill Hall on the St. Paul campus, and there are several other plantings um, on campus as well. So for identification, prairie drop seed is a fairly easily identifiable grass. Um, so it's a bunch grass, so it has this tight crown, but it also has these really indicative long arching slender leaves. Um, prairie drop seed also has a tall flowering stalk that emerges in late summer, so end of August, um, early September, and highly fragrant flowers. And the fragrance um, is certainly noticeable if you were walking by a planting of prairie drop seed plants. And some people describe it as smelling like buttered popcorn. Um, I don't really have the, the words to describe what I think it smells like. And the ecological reason behind having this fragrance is an area that's still under research um, currently. So the native range of prairie drop seed extends from the Atlantic coast all the way west to the Rocky Mountains and north into Canada. So it is a plant that we will see kind of sparsely throughout this large range um, in native plant communities, um, in tall grass prairies and short grass prairies, as well as kind of what we would think of as more Eastern environments like meadows. So prairie drop seed is an ecologically important plant. It has a deep root system that works to prevent erosion. Um, again, important on upland sites. It's a great forage grass for our native grazers and a critical source of food and shelter for at least five species of native Lepidoptera, including the federally threatened Dakota skipper and the federally endangered Powasheek skipperling. So this photo on the left is a Dakota skipper and we can see it's actually on a prairie drop seed leaf here. So it really highlights um, how very long and narrow these leaves are. So prairie drop seed is currently in decline in North America. So we looked at that wide native range, um, but within that range, it's often locally scarce. So smaller um, disparate populations throughout a wide range. And we see these declining populations um, largely on the East Coast. So prairie drop seed is endangered in Connecticut, Kentucky, Maryland, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, and threatened in New York and Ohio. However, it is not a listed um, meaning protected plant in Minnesota. So why is prairie drop seed struggling, right? Well, 
The major issue is habitat loss. However, we are going to talk about that um, in a little more depth later on in the presentation. So prairie drop seed is also, it's slow to germinate. It has lower rates of germination than comparable native grasses. Um, it's a poor competitor as a young seedling, and it is not commonly planted in restorations. And the reason it's not commonly planted is because it takes four to five years for prairie drop seed to reach maturity, um, meaning flowering or reproductive age. Um, so that means that when put in a restoration, there isn't this instantaneous um, wow effect, which is something that I think we as humans really like to have is this, this sudden result. But you know, we don't get that with prairie drop seed. So it's part of why it's not included in um, these restorations. So I mentioned prairie drop seed as um, having difficulty with germination and lower rates of germination um, than comparable grasses. And one thing that we need to think about here is viability, right? So um, whether the seeds are actually alive to begin with. And one common way of testing viability um, is using tetrazoleum or TZ testing. So this is a red dye that um, is uptaken by living tissues. However, tetrazoleum testing is often inaccurate for prairie drop seed. So prairie drop seed has a green seed coat, which interferes with the uptake of this stain. Um, so Romish in 2011 did um, some great research on tetrazoleum staining and prairie drop seed seed and found that um, batches tested with tetrazoleum came back with 74%, 99%, and 93% viability, but in actuality only had 59%, 68%, and 25% germination um, respectively, which means that commercial testing of viability may be inaccurate. So kind of to add to this problem with viability testing, the genus Sporobolus doesn't have one uniform pretreatment. So that means that each species needs to be pulled out and studied individually. For prairie drop seed, um, cold stratification followed by warm feeding is recommended and chemical treatments such as a gibberellic acid treatment have not been effective in increasing germination. However, fresh seed is critical. So we're spending this time talking about seeding um, because we know that prairie drop seed is an ecologically important plant and we know that it's not commonly included in restorations. So there's a real um, reason to find what we might consider like phase two or second tier planting or second tier um, planting. So ways to incorporate prairie drop seed after an initial planting. And this is commonly done um, as a way to increase species diversity um, for, you know, beyond just prairie drop seed. And the process for introducing these second phase um, plantings is called interseeding. So that's the practice of seeding directly into existing prairie turf. So interseeding really depends on having maximum seed to soil contact. And we know that it's unsuccessful for establishing prairie drop seed. In 2011, Fedo and Stort tested field seeding prairie drop seed in tilled plots. So that's maximum seed to soil contact. And of 164 plots, only four had any emergence. Um, and that's a problem because species diversity is really important in restoration. So when we can create restorations with high levels of species abundance, what we're doing is recreating what is considered a more natural condition. So what would have been at a site um, pre-destruction. And there are, of course, many benefits to establishing new populations of a species, um, benefits for um, protecting genetics against extinction, for um, our local and our native insect and animal communities, and, as, and for us humans as well. Um, so when we create a new population of a plant in a restoration, what we're doing is creating another opportunity for the public to engage with that species, right? So that's really about creating an educational opportunity for the wider public. And for us as researchers, when we create a new population, um, we're creating an opportunity to study the ecology and horticulture of this plant and about species, um, to study species interactions um, within a restoration site. So this photo on the right here, um, this is a wild native prairie drop seed population at Prairie Coteau Scientific and Natural Area in Pipestone County, so in the southwest of the state. And we have um, prairie drop seed here in the foreground, so what it would look like naturally in the wild, um, as well as a variety of other grasses and forbs in the background of the photo. 
So this is what we're kind of trying to recreate as far as increasing um, species diversity and restorations. So now we're going to move into our plant conservation part of the background information here. So plant conservation in North America. Well, approximately a third of plant species globally are threatened with extinction. And this is largely due to habitat loss and fragmentation. Although certainly other factors such as climate change and over harvesting can play a role. And in North America, 10% of our original grasslands are all that's estimated to remain. In 1995, LAD did a survey of 988 tall grass prairie plant species, including prairie drop seed, and found that over half of these are listed as rare or protected in at least one Midwest state. Um, so there are many organizations that are dedicated to plant conservation, the Center for Plant Conservation out of the San Diego Zoo, um, as well as Botanic Gardens Conservation International, which is um, headquartered in the United Kingdom. Closer to home, the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum does a lot of work on plant conservation. Dr. David Ramakal is the curator of endangered plants, and he works with um, many, many groups of plants and species. Um, but his largest project is native orchid conservation. And of course, our Minnesota state flower is the pink lady slipper, which is a terrestrial native orchid. So when we talk about plant conservation, there's really um, two halves of a whole here. So in situ conservation um, versus ex situ conservation. So in situ conservation means on site. So that's really conserving species in their native environment. And that's done through land conservation, right? So we're finding a population and we're preserving the land it sits on. And this is largely done by government agencies like our um, DNR scientific and natural areas and by nonprofits um, such as the Nature Conservancy. Though certainly private landowners could practice in situ conservation on their own land. Ex situ, on the other hand, means offsite. So this is removing species from their environment and housing them somewhere else. And it's predominantly done by zoos and botanic gardens. And so when I say removing species, it's not typically um, removing an adult plant. This is done through the wild collection of seeds or propagules. So identifying an in situ population, traveling there, um, collecting seed and bringing it back to be grown out in um, usually a botanic garden, right? And so the purpose for doing ex situ conservation is to um, protect, um, to create this backup population, right? So we're protecting plant genetics as well as actual, um, the entire plant um, in case of a localized or a more widespread extinction event. So these two halves of plant conservation, um, you know, they're quite distinct paths, but headed towards the same goal of preventing extinctions, right? And they're largely done by different organizations. So that creates kind of a gap between in situ and ex situ conservation. And so we need to find ways to try to bridge this gap to um, better work towards um, generalized plant conservation. And botanic gardens can serve as a, as a great mediator to bridge this gap. And when I say bridging um, the gap between in situ and ex situ conservation, what I'm really talking about is integrated plant conservation, which is a um, somewhat newish concept in plant conservation that it has to do with finding or creating this cyclical relationship between in situ and ex situ conservation. And so we kind of touched upon the bottom arrow here, collection. So wild collecting propagules from a wild population um, in situ and moving them off site for ex situ conservation. Um, but what's um, less common is the upper arrow restoration. And through the course of this presentation, we will talk about both wild collection and restoration. Now, of course, there are some barriers to integrated plant conservation. It's not, this, it's not quite a smooth cycle yet. And Havens et al. in 2014 did a study looking at what these barriers are. And what they found that lack of data is a, a real and serious issue. And when I say lack of data, I mean a lack of information and understanding on species distribution and rarity. And that's kind of the critical part, right? How do we know that a species is in need of conservation if we don't have information on its distribution or its rarity? And so a lack of data isn't a, a complete absence of data. We do have quite a bit of data, but there's problems with the information we have. So our limitations with current data, well, one, data is often not standardized. 
So every land manager, every public garden curator is going to take their notes in a different way, right? Data is also often not digitized, which right there is a major barrier to collaboration um, between groups. And then data is often out of date. So what we have on the left side of this slide here is an herbarium voucher of prairie drop seed from the Bell Museum Herbarium on our St. Paul campus. And so herbarium vouchers are a very um, traditional, very familiar way that people who practice ex situ conservation um, understand species distribution. So somebody planning a wild collecting trip would likely go to an herbarium and look at the vouchers there and plan their trip around this information. The problem is, um, you may have an herbarium voucher taken 100 years ago, and there's no guarantee that anybody has ever recataloged that site. So there's a real problem with knowing if populations still exist where they once did. And that takes us, you know, this issue of lack of data takes us right into our first project that I'm going to talk about. So the status of prairie drop seed in Minnesota. So our purpose here is to ascertain the status of native Minnesota prairie drop seed populations for conservation and collection, and to demonstrate how databases when combined with technology like GIS can be used to inform curation and conservation. So though we are discussing prairie drop seed here, um, these methods and these resources that I discuss are um, widely available for any other species um, of interest. So is prairie drop seed in decline? That's like the million dollar question, right? We know that prairie drop seed was once common in upland prairies. And we know because of a study by Johnson and Anderson in 1986, that prairie drop seed um, made up 13.5% of prairie cover, but only 5% of the seed bank. And this statistic in and of itself is not alarming. So um, many species have this discrepancy between prairie cover versus seed bank. But when we keep in mind that prairie drop seed is a species that can struggle with germination and struggle with competition as a young seedling, this statistic becomes a little more concerning. Now, looking at this map on the left-hand side, you know, we know that prairie drop seed is threatened or endangered in several Eastern states. What we're really looking at is Minnesota, right? And so Minnesota has this tan coloration to it, um, which is listed as no status rank. So that means we don't know if prairie drop seed is secure in Minnesota or threatened. Um, so when you see no status rank, another um, common phrase is data deficient. So we are data deficient in Minnesota. So what we did to address this problem was we examined 570 DNR releve records. So releve record is really just a system of analyzing the native plant community of a site. Um, so a plot is taken at a site and every plant species within that plot or surrounding that plot is recorded. Now Minnesota started taking releve records in 1971. So we have records from 1971 to 2018 that range from one plant to large populations. So this screenshot below here is what a series of releve records actually looks like. So it's just one line of data, um, of course, taxon name. This code here is um, percentage of species cover. Um, we have information on place name, habitat information, and then our newer records, GPS points, which of course is incredibly helpful if you want to wild collect from a population and you can get exactly there. And I want to point out that all of Minnesota's um, releve records are publicly accessible through the Minnesota Biodiversity Atlas. So that's through the Bell Museum Herbarium website. So if you have a favorite Minnesota plant, um, you'll find the records for it. So we looked at these DNR data sets, but we also looked at herbarium vouchers. Um, we wanted to look at herbarium vouchers for a few reasons. So um, one, we wanted as much information as possible, right? So having these additional data points um, was really valuable to us. Um, two, we wanted to look at what information we could find pre-1971, so before um, Minnesota adapted the releve system. Because we really wanted to look at species status change over time to see if the species um, is declining over time. And lastly, you know, we know that um, Herbarium vouchers are a very familiar and very common way um, that practitioners in the field, such as curators, 
look at species distribution. So we wanted to use the tools um, available to them or familiar to them as well. So we looked at 120 herbarium vouchers collected in Minnesota between 1880 and 2003. And they are housed at several different herbaria, the Bell Museum, the Ada Hayes Herbarium in Iowa, and the Missouri Botanic Garden Herbarium. And I'd like to point out again that all these records are publicly accessible um, through, the, or through the websites of the respective herbaria. So we could not determine species status change over time. So we had um, two data sets that we wanted to cross compare, right? Because we wanted to look at the herbarium data sets that was information pre-1971. However, because we had such a large difference in size of data sets, so 570 relevé records as opposed to 120 herbarium records, we couldn't cross compare the two data sets, which means we couldn't determine species status change over time. However, we did learn a lot of helpful information on distribution across counties and across habitats. So my collaborator, Nick Rebich at the Landscape Arboretum, created um, these two maps through GIS. So what we're looking at is distribution across the state of prairie drop seed occurrences. Um, and I will say that these two maps, the scale is very different because of the size of the data set. Um, so it could be encouraging, just could be confusing if you try to um, cross compare. So for now, we're just gonna look at our DNR um, releve records map. And what we can see here is that prairie drop seed is most common in the southern part of the state and then of course the northwest corner, which makes sense because it's a prairie plant so we wouldn't expect to see it in um, a heavily wooded region of the state. And we can also look at these maps and pull out a specific county. So we chose to look at Polk County, um, which is in the northwest corner of Minnesota. And so this is a um, map showing the spatial distribution of prairie drop seed occurrences. So your blue dots are your DNR occurrences and your red dots are your Bell Herbarium occurrences. And there's a lot of interesting information on this map. So if we look at our image on, or our circle here on the left-hand side, we can see a red dot overlaying a blue dot. So what that tells us is that that is a well-cataloged population there because it occurs across both data sets. And it may be a long-living population as well. Now, the other interesting information on this map is actually how these occurrences are distributed across the county. So I'm gonna direct your attention to this clump of occurrences on the right-hand side or the eastern side of the county. So this is incredibly helpful practical information because you know most of us in plant conservation work for nonprofits. So we're working on a limited budget and we wanna be able to collect um, seed from as many populations as possible in a limited amount of time. So knowing where exactly to go in a state to hit as many populations as possible is really helpful practical information. Now I also talked about how we could look at prairie drop seed occurrences across habitat, right? So what we're looking at is data just from our DNR data site on native plant community type. Um, so this is how the DNR um, catalogs habitat types, uh, types across Minnesota. So Southern meaning the Southern half of the state, dry indicates an upland area and prairie is um, less than 25% woody plants. And so the vast majority of prairie drop seed occurrences are in this, um, this Southern dry prairie, this top line. So that makes sense, right? Because looking at our statewide DNR map, we can see that the majority of counties with occurrences of prairie drop seed are in the southern part of the state, um, which is where a lot of the prairie land is. So, you know, I said that we couldn't look at species status change over time because we couldn't cross compare the data sets. But we were able to look just at our DNR data set, so just at records from 1971 to 2018, and pull out eight locations that had at least um, two occurrences at least 10 years apart. And so what this is is species cover code, so it's percentage of the canopy that is prairie drop seed. And we can see that at five of these eight locations, prairie drop seed is in decline, including um, rather steeply at one location. And that prairie drop seed has remained the same at two locations and actually increased in cover at one location. And though eight locations is certainly not enough to extrapolate to the rest of the state, it is interesting information for us to keep in mind. So 
you know, we've talked at length now about this bottom arrow, this collection arrow. So how ex situ or ex situ conservation depends on in situ conservation, right? So now we're gonna move into the upper arrow and we're gonna talk a little bit about restoration. So that brings us right to the second project, increasing rates of establishment of prairie drop seed in restored prairies. So the purpose here was to test various methods for adding prairie drop seed to restored prairies with the hope that this research will aid restoration and prairie management professionals in increasing prairie drop seed populations in established prairies. And the objectives were to evaluate the effectiveness of a hydrogel treatment in increasing plug survival and growth, and to evaluate the change in survival and growth rates for plugs grown in native soils versus plugs grown in potting mix. So these are what plugs are, right? So they're kind of these not super young, um, but not exactly old seedlings. And plugs are used as an alternative for seeding for species that are rare, dispersal limited, or difficult to establish from seed. So yes, prairie drop seed would be difficult to establish from seed. They're also used in sites with high competition. Um, so a restoration that has already been planted and maybe is decades old and has a dense canopy is certainly a site with high competition. So the benefit of plugs is that it allows us to kind of bypass the most vulnerable stages of a young plant's life, right? So we can um, germinate seedlings and grow them out um, past the super young seedling phase in the controlled conditions of a greenhouse um, where they don't have to compete and they don't have to risk or fit breed. Now, there are downsides to plugs. Um, so we're putting all of these um, tender young plants out in the prairie. So there is a high risk of herbivory. Um, and there is a um, risk of winter heaving too, so popping the plugs um, straight out of the ground. So we actually chose to purchase in some of our plugs. So we wanted to look at plugs grown in potting mix versus native soils. So the plugs that were grown in potting mix, potting mix we purchased from Prairie Resto Inc. and from Minnesota Native Landscapes. And the reason we decided to buy plugs in was that we wanted to replicate as closely as possible what a restorationist would actually have available to them. So these are two um, well-known firms um, for contract restoration and native plant nurseries in the Twin Cities area. So it really is what a restorationist would have to work with. So all of our seed um, and our purchased seedlings were sourced from seed from Polk County, Minnesota. So um, remaining within the state of Minnesota. And plugs are not, um, not cheap, right? So $7.50 for six plugs versus um, $15 for one ounce of seed. Um, so we really have a financial incentive to find ways to make sure our plugs survive. So this is where um, we talk about our treatments, right? So plugs grown in this potting mix versus plugs grown in native soils. So we decided to test native soils because of AM or mycorrhizal fungi. And so these are types of fungi that form mutualistic relationships with plants. And they're you know, very common across many groups of plants. And I'm sure if you are um, in agronomy or a home gardener, you are likely familiar with these commercial AM fungal inoculants that you can buy. Um, so the problem with purchasing um, commercial fungal inoculants is that these inoculants may not be strains that are effective for native plants. So mom in 2016 um, did some great research on um, fungal inoculants in native plants and found that commercial strains of fungi are generalists that typically protect from pathogens. However, native plants use these relationships to increase nutrient uptake, um, not protect from pathogens. And of course, there is a risk of introducing a non-native um, fungal strain to our native soils um, when we don't understand how that strain may interact with the rest of the soil biome. Now there is a precedence for using plugs grown in native soil and Kozil et al in 2018 treated plugs with native AM fungi and found that those plugs were 40% more likely to survive than plugs that were not treated um, with fungi. They also found that plots treated with a native um, fungal strain had increased rates of germination and species diversity over those that were untreated. And this is important because we know prairie drop seed is a fungal affiliate. Um, so Evers et al. in 1987 did a study looking at prairie drop seed roots um, and spore levels on those roots. And they found that for prairie drop seed, spore levels 
um, can range from 7.7% to 48.6%. And this is dependent on seasonal changes. They also found that spore abundance is inversely related to calcium and magnesium availability. Um, so this is also interesting because we know prairie job seed has a preference for native um, fungal species. So Dylan in 1992 did a study looking at fungal strains on prairie job seed roots and what the most common fungal species um, affiliated with prairie job seed were. So Globus is a um, native genus of um, AM fungi that's common in our prairie soils here. And it is a strain or it's a genus where this it is used to increase phosphorus uptake in native plants. So again, going back to a mom's study, noting that our North American native um, prairie plants tend to use their fungal affiliates to uptake nutrients rather than to protect from pathogens. So we grew out plugs in our native soils, um, collected the soil at each planting site in fall of 2019 and overwintered it um, in a cooler at 40 degrees. Um, we intentionally, of course, did not sterilize our soil because we wanted to keep the soil biome as intact as um, we possibly could. So then we sowed our flats um, with our native soils and with seed from KSD seed. So that's Polk County, again, sourced seed and germinated them in the mist house, um, the plant growth facilities on our St. Paul campus. So we finished our plugs in war a warm greenhouse and hardened them off in cold frames for four days before planting. And what may be obvious to you and what we certainly learned was that if you put field soil in perfect conditions for germination and you do not sterilize that soil, every single seed is going to germinate. So I got really good at identifying my prairie drop seed seedlings, um, which are these ones here with the kind of long leggy leaves and not any other um, species contaminating the plugs like, like this big bully here. So we went through three times and ended up weeding out our unwanted species. So we're confident that we only had prairie drop seed in our plugs and that was all we were introducing to our prairie restorations. So that kind of covers the native soil half. So now we're gonna move on to hydrogels, um, which I mentioned earlier. So hydrogels are hydropilic polymers that can hold 400 to 1500 times their dry weight. And they are, um, can be synthetic, semi-synthetic, or starch-based. And the synthetic type is the most common um, for horticultural applications. Um, there's a wide variety among brands, but the brand we used is actually this, um, this Miracle Grow brand here, which is 100% polyacrylamide. So what happens is they come, hydrogels come as this dry crystal form. And you soak them, um, we just used water, we didn't add any fertilizer here. And they take on all this water and become this, this jello texture, right? And the idea is that when you treat a plug with hydrogels, over time, the hydrogel will slowly leach that water. So you're providing extra moisture to the plug um, without having to use extra labor. Now there are concerns, right, about introducing um, a synthetic chemical to our prairie soils and our prairie biomes. And so there has been research done on how polyacrylamide is broken down. So Josie and Abbott in 2017 looked at um, aerobic and anaerobic degradation of polyacrylamide. And they found that both are possible through bacterial um, degradation and fungal degradation. So bacterial degradation can break down polyacrylamide um, from 16 to 91%, depending on bacteria species. And fungal degradation can break down this polymer from 60 to 80%, again, dependent on species. But this is in a lot in a lab setting. So in our soils, polyacrylamide actually breaks down, um, it's found 22.5% in the course of two years. Um, and that's research by Nisola and Algren done in 2019. So hydrogels are not new in restoration, um, right? So I wouldn't say they're commonly used, but they're certainly a tool that practitioners are familiar with. Thomas in 2008 um, did a study looking at hydrogel root dip, so dunking the plant in soaked hydrogels, and how it reduced mortality in two woody plant species, Eucalyptus pilularis and Corymbia cidiodora subspecies variegata. And he found that in the eucalyptus, the hydrogel treatment reduced mortality from 25% to 12%, and for the Cidiodora, um, from 14% to 
He also found that hydrogels seem to increase leaf retention and root shoot growth. So that is an interesting study, right? But again, those are woody plants. Um, so this Lucero study, the second study, um, is one that's um, more immediately relevant to our work with prairie drop seed. Because Lucero et al. treated Budalua areopoda um, with hydrogels post-planting. And Budalua areopoda is black grama, um, pictured on the right here, which is another North American native grass. And they found that hydrogels did not seem to affect survival or root mass but that plugs treated with hydrogels showed increased leaf mass and total leaf area. So our hypotheses were that using hydrogels during planting will increase the rate of survival and growth of plugs of prairie drop seed planted in restored prairies. And using plugs grown in native soil will increase the rate of survival and growth of plugs of prairie drop seed planted in restored prairies. So for our experimental design, we had three experimental sites at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. And within each site, we had 101 meter by one meter plots in a complete randomized block design. And within each one meter squared plot, we planted 10 plugs. So we had three plantings, fall 2019, spring 2020, and fall 2020. And that was because we were interested if there would be a difference in survival between um, a spring planting versus a fall planting. And then we have three harvests scheduled, August 2020, October 2020, and August 2021. And you'll notice that we don't have an August, an October 2021 harvest. And that's simply because um, we needed to wrap up the project. So again, we have our plugs grown in native soil versus potting mix, and our plugs treated with hydrogel immediately before planting versus plugs that were watered immediately after planting. So they did not receive a hydrogel treatment. And following planting, there was no further care. Um, again, we're trying to replicate as close as we can a um, actual restoration situation where further care would not be possible for planting. So this is um, a mock-up of what our plots look like. So complete randomized block design, you can see that the planting types and the soil types are color coded out and that the hydrogel treatment is indicated by either an H in the plot, of course, meaning hydrogel, or a W, which means um, like watered after planting, so no hydrogel. So our three sites, um, so we wanted to do this project at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum for a few reasons. Um, it, of course, it's available to us, which is definitely um, a good reason to work there. And the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum had three upland prairie sites that were of varying ages of restoration, right? So if we are going to look at plugs and look at survival rates in restorations, we need it to be applicable to restorations of varying ages. So we don't wanna say, you know, oh, our research is only applicable to restorations under five years of age. Um, so that was a very strong incentive for using the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. And all three of these sites that we selected are um, what would be considered a southern upland prairie, which we know from our database work is where prairie drop seed is most likely to flourish. Um, also, I am, as Michael mentioned in the intro, a public gardens person, so I was very excited to work out of the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. So not a main reason, but something that I was happy about. So our three sites. So our oldest site was the Bennett Johnson Prairie and restoration began here in 1965. Um, the predominant grasses are big and little bluegrass and Indian grass. And the soil is a Kilkenny Lester loam with a pH of 6.6 .6 and 4.6% organic matter. Our kind of middle age site is Spring Peeper Meadow. Restoration began in 1995 and you can see that it's predominantly a wetland restoration, right? But it does have this upland site, which is of course where we situated our research plot. And at this upland portion, um, big blue stem is the predominant grass. The soil is a Lester Kilkenny loam with a pH of 7.5 and 2.1% organic matter. And our youngest site was Lake Tamarack. Um, so restoration began here in 2015. Um, it had previously been row crops. And unlike our other two sites, Lake Tamarack is planted as a short grass prairie. So the predominant grasses are side oats, grama, and little bluestone. The soil is a Lester Kilkenny complex with a pH of 7.2 and 1.8% organic matter. 
So our planting procedure, right? We already talked about having our three plantings, the fall 2019, spring 2020, and fall 2020. And we kept in mind as we were planting that we have to be able to find these little seedlings again for survival and harvest, right? So we wanted to make it as easy as possible to identify them. And for that reason, we planted um, a plastic nursery tag right in the ground with the plug. And we also planted our plugs in a 3-2-3-2 pattern. And the reason we did this was because if a tag gets lost, a nursery tag gets lost, we can follow the pattern here to locate you know, a general area where a plug should be rather than um, trying to root around in the entirety of the meter square plot looking for a lost plug. So we planted using a two inch masonry bit on a regular power drill and we drilled straight into the prairie um, sod. And again, this was a great for labor saving, right? Um, and it created standardized size holes. So in fall 2019, we only used our potting mix, our nursery dome plugs bought in from Prairie Resto. And the reason that we did this was because we had just started the project and we didn't have time to grow out um, soil grown or field soil grown plugs yet. But we wanted to get plants in the ground because we wanted, um, of course, additional data points. So we planted total 20 total plots per site and this divides evenly um, 10 plots treated with the hydrogel and 10 treated without the hydrogel so our spring 2020 and fall 2020 plots were um, a little bit more complicated because we had both our nursery grown plugs um, which was the potting mix and our native soil grown plugs so at each of the three sites we planted 40 total plots um, for both spring and fall. So 40 in spring and 40 in fall. And this breaks down evenly to have 10 plots um, with the potting mix and the hydrogel, 10 with the potting mix without the hydrogel, 10 with the native soil with the hydrogel, and 10 with the native soil without the hydrogel. So then we had harvest, right? So um, again, the three harvests, the August 2020, October 2020, and upcoming August 2021. And we plan to harvest two plugs from each plot. Um, and so we found that using this three inch diameter bulb planter was the best way to harvest. It had a sharp edge that would dig right into the prairie sod and it would give us this solid core of soil um, that would completely surround the plant. So we really wanted to get below ground data as well as above ground because of course, um, roots are a critically important part of our plants. Um, we need to be able to study them. So this um, bulb planter allowed us to get deep enough in the ground to get the roots. Um, so following harvest, we had these soil cores and we stored them in paper bags refrigerated at 40 degrees Fahrenheit until the roots could be washed. So that was typically overnight. And I'm sure this will be no surprise to anyone, but it is very difficult to find one specific grass seedling in a prairie. So I am very thankful to the people who helped me with harvest. You can see um, my advisor, Mary, and Kayla, an undergrad who worked with us using this bulb planter um, to harvest in October. So thank you to both of you. So following harvest, we had to wash all of our roots, um, right? Because we were going to take dry weights of shoot and root growth. So we would start out with the solid soil core on the left, and then we would slowly and gently swirl that soil core um, in a five gallon bucket of water to get off all of the soil, all the organic matter, um, the occasional earthworm was in those cores, and end up with what we would see here, so a completely washed plant. So at this stage, we separated the shoots from the roots to be dried in individual bags. Um, so our our roots and shoots were dried at 95 degrees Fahrenheit for two to four days. Now, um, among our three harvests and with harvesting two plants from each plot, and we will continue um, in August 2021 with the two plants survival allowing, we should have a total of 1800 um, plugs harvested. Now, of course, these dry weights aren't our only data points. So we also took survival counts. We took counts in June, um, right when our warm season grasses are starting to show growth um, to look at winter survival. And again in August to look at survival through the hot, dry months um, of the year. So our, our final results are still pending. So I'm going to um, wrap up with a summary here. 
So more research uh, definitely needs to be done looking at the status of prairie drop seed in Minnesota. So that was our first project looking at those maps. And new technology is critical for informing our wild collection and conservation efforts. Now, plugs may be a viable way to incorporate prairie drop seed into restored prairies. However, there is still a need for practical information to inform our restoration and our conservation professionals. I would like to take a moment to thank everyone who helped me with this project, my advisor, Mary Meyer, my advisory committee of Mary um, Sukolatovich and Stan Hokinson, the entire team at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum who were absolutely wonderful um, working on this project. Fernando Hernandez and Richard DeVries of the Natural Lands team um, who helped me with site identification as well as plantings. Um, Susie Cope, who's one of the horror managers who helped with a lot of the, the logistical and organizational um, parts of working at the Arboretum. Nick Krivich, of course, the cartographer who uh, made those great GIS maps for us and many others. Kayla Smith, um, I mentioned, is an undergrad who worked with us on planting and harvest and root washing. And some of my friends actually were willing to volunteer their time to help with root washing. Um, so thank you, Lindsay and Liesl, and thank you, everyone else who worked on this project. Um, so now I am going to take any questions you might have relating to what I discussed today. Thank you. Great presentation, Catherine. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, we already have two questions in the Q&A, so I guess we'll start with those. Uh, Peter Moe is wondering, were existing plants removed or controlled before planting prairie drop seed? So that's a great question. Um, so no, we did not remove any plants. We didn't want to disturb the plants that were already there. However, before planting, we did um, use a brush blade on um, weed whips to clear the area um, so that we could you know, not have all this tall grass plants that we were trying to work around. Um, however, we didn't actually dig anything up or disturb the soil. Awesome. Uh, Mary Meyer is wondering, are you aware of any negative findings about using hydrogels in native restorations? So that is an area that needs a lot more research. Um, I will say I am not aware of any um, published findings, but again, that's an area that could use some work. Awesome. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We still got a few coming in. Uh, Lu Yin says, thank you for the seminar. Is the root washing for measuring the biomass, I assume? What, uh, was there other traits you measured in your different treatments? So yes, the root washing was to measure um, root biomass. And so we did that through the dry weights. Um, and we didn't look at other factors. Um, so doing a count of crowns would be something that would commonly be done when researching grasses. Um, the problem we ran into is our plants were so small that um, a lot of these factors, um, like number of crowns and like you know leaf length, um, were pretty minute. Um, so we really did focus just on the dry weights and the survival counts. All right. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, will there be any plant plants left in the sites? Um, so the hope is that yes, there will be, and that is certainly survival depending. But our plan to harvest two plot two plant, excuse me, two plugs per site. Um, should leave four plants still at each site. Um, but again, we have seen, um, you know, some die. So it, it's not really something I can definitively answer, but the hope is that there will still be plants at the site. All right. Uh, while we wait for more to come in, I was wondering, um, so you have three uh, locations mm -hmm. around the Arboretum that are relatively close to each other geographically. Um, are these fairly representative of restoration sites across Minnesota, um, or would more studies need to be done to see how the environment's going to affect, play a role in like the hydrogels and native soil versus potting soil? So I would hesitate to say they're 
widely representative of the rest of the state. Um, of course, you would see differences in soil, you would see differences in plant composition. And when we're talking about restorations, um, you're likely to see sites that you know, may have been contaminated previously, um, which would be a whole different, um, whole different thing altogether. However, looking at um, these ages, I do feel that having a restoration that began in the 60s, a restoration that began in the 90s, and a restoration that began um, just in 2015 is a pretty good range of ages for looking at um, our restoration sites. Okay. Uh, Dorothy Sweet uh, is wondering, does prairie drop seed reprodu reproduce by seed only? This seems difficult if they need maximum contact with the ground. So yeah, I'm, in an ornamental setting, you could certainly divide the crown of the plant up um, to you know, repropagate it. But for prairie drop seed in the wild, in these um, restoration wild settings, it is seed propagated, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that is kind of why we're a little bit worried about the trouble with germination and competition as a young seedling. Okay. Uh, Roger Becker is wondering, precipitation and temperatures during the trials, how did it play out relative to normal and thoughts on drier versus wetter periods and effects on your results? Yeah, so when we planted in fall of 2019, the day we planted, I don't know if all of you remember, we had a snowstorm and it was freezing. Um, and when I say freezing, I mean low 30s. Um, but then we had kind of a warm spell right after that. So that was, um, I wouldn't say particularly typical, but then again, we had that this year as well after our October planting. So um, I you know, really should have put that in the presentation, our pre precipitation amounts um, and our temperature gradients. But I think it was a fairly common year, um, although somewhat dry over our summer months, which is um, not great for the plugs. Um, and that's what kind of the hydrogels were hoping to impact. All right. Are there any other I this is Cody. I had a, a quick question. Um, you know, these synthetic hydrogels, mm -hmm. maybe um, that you've been talking about, I was wondering, you know, as, as when I think about people that are restoring prairies, a lot of times there's some kind of, you know, land, more of a land ethic kind of um, thing being brought mm -hmm. in. And I'm just wondering, is there resistance to this synthetic, you know, something that might not break down as quickly, or are they just really looking in uh, uh, for getting the establishment uh, done? So in um, myself talking to practitioners and then talking to um, hobbyist homeowners who do this on their private property, practitioners seem um, pretty open-minded to using hydrogels. Um, I have noticed that some of these um, private homeowners are averse to using hydrogels because they are concerned about that. So I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case situation. Um, I think it helps that these aren't um, a completely novel idea so that restorationists, even if they haven't used hydrogels before, are familiar with what they are. Um, but again, it really depends on the landowner and some of them are um, not willing to use hydrogels because they're worried about the, how it would degrade in the soils. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question from a, an anonymous attendee. If it takes four to six years for the plants to reach maturity, how long on average will prairie drop seed live? So um, I actually did some reading about this this weekend because I wanted to make sure I got it right. And what I found was prairie drop seed typically lives um, 15 to 20 years, but there are um, cases where people have found that it lives um, beyond 20 years. So it is what um, I would consider a fairly long lived plant, um, even though it does take you know, that slow four to five years to reach reproductive age. Um, Ethan Lay would like to know, I know more research is needed about hydrogels. Are hydrogels rated for specific soil environments? I noticed the sites you chose all had similar pH and was curious how hydrogels may perform in less neutral environments. Yeah, so that was one of the um, kind of pitfalls of using all sites at the landscape arboretum, right, was that the soils were all 
um, pretty similar. So hydrogels are not braided for soil types, at, at least not in any of the reading I have done. And so it's certainly possible that they would react differently depending on more extreme levels in pH. And that is, again, I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer, but that's something that would need to be researched um, more in depth. Anyone else has a question, feel free to hit the raise hand button or type it into the Q&A. Before we leave, Catherine, is, could you just talk a little bit about your thoughts on the impact of climate change on uh, you know, the population change that you were observing at uh, five of your eight sites? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, you know, the, these populations are really isolated now. It's wind uh, pollinated. What impact do you think climate change could have um, on uh, on these on these populations and the vigor of these populations over time as climate changes? Yeah. So I would say I did um, quite a bit of research on this, um, and I what I learned was that really climate change is. Um, kind of a topic of less concern related to prairie drop seed because when we look at these fragmented populations, um, you know, habitat destruction kind of beat climate change um, to the punch here as far as um, destroying our populations, um, right, of prairie drop seed. And also we know that prairie drop seed is a species that would naturally not be covering its native range um, to a deeply high, high percentage. So prairie drop seed naturally occurs in smaller populations that are already quite spread out um, across this large native range. So I think, you know, that's not to say climate change isn't a risk and it isn't something that we should be thinking about regarding prairie drop seed. It certainly is. And there are, you know, certainly risks associated with climate change making sites um, unlivable for prairie drop seeds. So we would think about this in the site of a, in the case of a site being um, too wet, suddenly having too many rain events where it's sitting and kind of rotting since we know prairie drop seed prefers these dry, well-drained soils. Um, so Certainly climate change is a risk and it is a little bit less of a risk for wind pollinated grasses than um, our insect pollinated plants because prairie dropsy doesn't have to align its flowering time with the life cycle of, a, of an insect that would be thrown off by climate change, right? So I'm giving you kind of a rambling answer and the succinct answer here is that climate change is absolutely a worry and that we do need to do more research on the stability of these smaller populations of prairie drop seed, especially in the face of climate change. But regarding um, prairie drop seed in particular, the major concern here is really this habitat loss and destruction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions out there? Not seeing anything in the Q&A or raised hands. With that, uh, I think we'll conclude this seminar. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Catherine, for a great seminar. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Cody, it's back into your hands. Uh, make sure that everyone is off except for uh, the people.